and welcome to the start of the 2014 Wolverine Caucus Forums. And I guess I can officially say go blue today because all of us are probably blue from four degrees outside. <laughs> but what a good day to talk about hydraulic fracturing here in Michigan. And what an opportunity we have to have one of the foremost presenters from the University of Michigan today to discuss it with you. And as you know, these forums are brought to us by the uh, University of Michigan Alumni Association and the Office of the Vice President for Government Relations. And we thank all of you for being here today and wanted to acknowledge particularly uh, State Representative Cindy Denby and uh, Representative Andrew Kondravis, who is going to introduce our speaker. Speaking of Rep. Kendravis, a good alum of the University of Michigan, as you know, he's on the Appropriations Committee in the House, and he is uh, from the great city of Southgate, District 13. So without further ado, Representative Kendravis, take it away. Thank you. Thank you very much. Again, Happy New Year. It's uh, great to kick off another, another series of the Wolverine Caucus. And uh, looking at the itinerary for the months ahead, it looks like there's some really great lectures. Um, today we have uh, with us uh, John Callowert. John Callowert is the Integrated Assessment Center Director at the University of Michigan's Graham Sustainability Institute. John works in collaboration with the IA faculty research teams and participates on IA projects, conducting research as appropriate with results used in broader IA research projects. I know you guys will love this. John earned a BS in Agricultural Engineering Technology from Michigan State University. And we got a lot of Spartans in the room. <laughs> and his PhD from the School of Natural Resources and Environment at U of M Ann Arbor. John serves as an associate editor for the Journal of Environmental Studies and Sciences and as an advisory board member for the Integrated Assessment Society. So please welcome John Callowert. If you could give me a minute here while I transition. Great, thanks. Well, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Representative Kondravis, for the introduction. Thank you, Veronica, and the staff of the Office of the Vice President for uh, Government Relations and the alumni folks for putting this all together. It's a real honor to be here with you today. Uh, what I plan to do is talk about one of these assessments that we're doing at the Graham Sustainability Institute and um, on the topic of hydraulic fracturing, which is something I think has been uh, one of the key issues of discussion within the state of Michigan, across the country, and actually globally, too. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to acknowledge the other partner units that we're doing this assessment with. It's the Graham Sustainability Institute, but we're also partnering with the Herb Institute out of the School of Natural Resources and Environment and the uh, Raw School of Business, with the Risk Science Center in the School of Public Health, and the Energy Institute. Uh, so it's really a partnership of these four units at U of M that is putting this assessment together. So what I'd like to do is just talk very briefly with you about what is this Graham Institute, what do we do, and what are these integrated assessments? Uh, hydraulic fracturing is one of several that we have going on, and I'll briefly mention what some of the other ones are too. Uh, we have a few key points about hydraulic fracturing in Michigan to kind of set the context for what you know, are some of the key things we should kind of know before moving into a discussion about the topic. And then the most of my time I'll spend talking about this integrated assessment that we're currently about halfway through on the topic of hydraulic fracturing in the state of Michigan. And I'll say kind of who's involved, how we're proceeding, uh, what we've produced so far, and where we think we're going over the next year with this. And then we'll save some time for questions and discussion at the end of the, the session. So the Graham Institute has been in operation at the University of Michigan for about six years. It was created through a generous uh, gift from our founder and funder, Don Graham, whose uh, father was a faculty member in the School of Natural Resources and Environment in, I think, in the 50s. And it's also supported through uh, the Office of the Provost. So we really try to work across the 19 units and colleges at the University of Michigan on the topic of sustainability. So it's just as likely for me to be working with someone from the School of Natural Resources as it is for me to be working with somebody from engineering, urban planning, or uh, public policy. That was a key issue for our donor and, and founder, uh, Don Graham, to, to create us, uh, institute in a way that would help us work across the way. 
uh, across all those schools and colleges. Uh, some folks say that the only thing that unites all the schools and colleges at U of M is parking and football, or complaints about parking and football, but we're trying to make that, you know, and the Graham Institute is, is working to make those connections across all those units and colleges. Uh, what's that? No, but I think it's a common, everybody's interested in it though, no. <clears throat> Uh, we have three main areas that we focus on. Institutional leadership. Uh, our uh, director of the institute, Don Scavia, is a, a special counsel to President Mary Sue Coleman on issues of sustainability for the university. And we also do several other projects that where we try to support institutional initiatives around the topic of sustainability. We have key programs in education where we don't offer degrees. We offer special programs from students from undergraduates to postdoctoral fellows, uh, providing uh, funding opportunities, research opportunities, and opportunities for them to come together again from all the different units across the university and programs to think and talk about sustainability together. And then the third area, which we call translational knowledge, is taking the, the resources, the ideas, the passion, the interest of faculty and staff at the university and bringing that into dialogue with folks outside the university on challenging sustainability issues. And that's where the integrated assessment uh, program fits in. We really try to create platforms and opportunities to bring those uh, institutional resources we have at the university, both uh, human and financial, with uh, folks outside the university to work on really challenging sustainability topics. It's very much an applied approach to research. We work with some of the, the best information and experts on a topic, but we really try to set it up in a way where there's an informed dialogue, an engaged dialogue with a broad range of stakeholders or decision makers who are interested on a particular topic. Uh, we try to enter into these uh, discussions from the perspective of kind of an honest broker of information, trying to provide what we hope can be some of the best information on a topic and an analysis of information and, and analysis of options or strategies for that topic. We're not issue advocates. We don't come with this is you know, the one thing that should be done. And we're also not kind of the, the pure science folks that might you know, do their uh, work in a lab, uh, produce a scholarly publication, but uh, see that as kind of the, the end of their engagement in a topic. We really try to be that broker of information to try to bring it together and have it be informed by uh, folks outside the university who have the practical experience, the, the knowledge, and the expertise on issues. We have a broad range of projects underway through our Integrated Assessment Center. Uh, we've looked at topics as uh, close as uh, developing sustainability goals for the Ann Arbor campus itself. We've got a couple initiatives in Detroit looking at sustainable redevelopment, one with Data Driven Detroit and another with the group Focus Hope. In Michigan, we have this one on hydraulic fracturing that I'll we'll talk in a little bit more detail in just a minute. Uh, we also have a regional one looking at climate adaptation for mid and small size cities throughout the Great Lakes region, U.S. and Canada, uh, trying to bring together some of the best information about climate change, climate adaptation for decision makers in cities. At the national level, we've got a couple of projects looking at the whole topic of sustainable transportation, livable communities, connected vehicles, uh, trying to bring together some uh, ideas and decision making tools around that. And at the international level, we've got two projects, one in Ghana and another in Peru, looking at the connection between water and health. With all of these integrated assessments, we follow a same basic approach. We try to start with defining what is it that we're trying to, to get a better handle on. What is it that we're either concerned about or worried about or interested in? Uh, we try to, throughout the process, try to clarify it by, you know, looking at is there historical information that can help us understand this better. What are the causes and consequences related to the issue? Uh, eventually identify some potential solutions or decision-making tools and ultimately come up with some policy options. That's kind of the, the center of the, the project. It's informed in two ways. One, by the scientific or technical assessments that go along with any project where we're working with data, doing analysis, evaluating options, and developing new resources, while simultaneously working with stakeholder and decision maker input. Uh, that can offer, you know, be direct through meetings that we have or through surveys, you know, a whole range of tools that we can use to try to get a better understanding of a topic from folks that are working with it on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, we also work with stakeholder input to help uh, evaluate and prioritize uh, the options that we're coming up with. So it's really an iterative dialogue. It's not like we come to the table and say, 
here's the best information, you know, take it. It's more, here's where we're going with this, here's how we think we can analyze that, but have that be informed by input from stakeholders and decision makers. So, you know, why do it this way? It's, it's a little more complicated, it's a little more time consuming, it can be a little more messy in terms of engagement with, uh, you know, a broad range of opinions around a topic. But through some work we've done to evaluate our own work and looking at how others who are using this approach, you know, why do it this way? Well, there's some key, you know, benefits to this type of approach, this integrated assessment approach. One is it can generate some really good uh, reports, supporting data, background information on a topic that might not have existed before. So it can help advance an understanding of a topic. Through this engaged dialogue, many people who've been in, involved in other integrated assessments have said it's helped kind of shift their understanding of a topic. You know, maybe not completely, but you know, they kind of see things a little bit differently through, the, through the, you know, reading the materials or being involved in the dialogues. So they've recognized that it's helped modify their perspectives and sometimes develop new partnerships with folks that they hadn't really worked with before or were uh, even aware of. Uh, it can change processes in terms of how things are done. We've seen that at the university itself with our own sustainability goal framework. We went from you know, always trying to do a little bit better in terms of energy conservation or recycling to now having some very specific goals that we are working hard to complete by 2025. So it kind of shifted the way that the university is functioning around sustainability goals. And many people have said that you know, this whole process helps them then leverage additional resources for future work, whether it's implementation or further research, just kind of going through this process puts them in a better position to uh, work with others or to perhaps get grants or other uh, funding for initiatives that they're, they're trying to advance. So before we kind of you know, move into the specifics of what uh, we're doing with this integrated assessment, I just wanted to share a couple of key points about hydraulic fracturing in Michigan. So it's a process that has been used for quite a long time. Now there's different aspects to it, and I'll explain that in a little bit, but if you want to look at in you know, the state of Michigan, this process of hydraulic, hydraulically fracturing, using that process to extract oil and gas has been used for quite a while. It's, you know, the map that's there, and sorry, it's, it's small, um, uh, but really it's showing in this band, many of you might know this, kind of across here, there's been thousands of wells, oil and gas wells, and many, many, many of those wells have been hydraulically fractured over, over, over years. Uh, looking at oil and gas within Michigan and what the state is doing, there was a review that was done about 10 years ago that said, you know, things are managed pretty well in Michigan in terms of oil and gas. Uh, I should, that was not specific to hydraulic fracturing though, but in terms of, you know, when we're talking about hydraulic fracturing, sometimes we have to set it within the context of broader oil and gas development. The integrated assessment, or I'm going to start saying IA just to cut down, the IA has, uh, been developed to focus primarily on high volume hydraulic fracturing, which if we follow DEQ uh, guidance on this or rules on this, that's any uh, completion that uses more than 100,000 gallons of fluid in the process to hydraulically fracture. So we're working with that state definition. That's a Michigan specific definition. Other states have uh, different definitions, either lower volumes or higher volumes, but for Michigan, it's anything using more than 100,000 gallons of fluid in that completion process. And the amount of, so HVHF, high volume hydraulic fracturing, is actually pretty limited in Michigan. There's been a lot of talk about interest, but there really hasn't been that much. What this map here shows is about uh, 50 permitted facilities, kind of uh, sites scattered across the state. There's been roughly, I haven't checked the latest numbers, around 20 completions. Um, and these, again, are those uh, activities that are using uh, above that threshold of 100,000 gallons of fluid, um, but sometimes can use, have used quite a bit more. The last summer there were reports of several in the Kalkaska area, individual completions using in the area of 20 million gallons of water. So it's an issue of scale here that I want to emphasize at this point. So there's been a lot of hydraulic fracturing that has taken place. There's a lot of oil and gas development and activity in Michigan, but this high volume activity, so maybe going down rather than 2,000 feet uh, in the drilling operation for some of the, the activity that's taken place over the last couple of decades, we might be talking about going down 5,000 feet or more, going down vertically and then out horizontally 
using rather than, say, as an, you know, a rough estimate, as an average for some of the uh, previous completions, 50,000 gallons of water. We're now talking anything above that 100,000 gallon threshold. And we have seen some completions that have used in the area of 20 million gallons of water. So it's this issue of scale, depth, and amount of water and materials that are being used. And I think it's, it's no surprise to anybody here, I think there's a broad range of perspectives and the benefits and problems of expanded natural gas use that I think we have to acknowledge as we uh, talk about this. There's been some studies that have looked at, you know, is natural gas a bridge to a cleaner, greener energy future? I would say, in my own personal opinion, that there isn't kind of a definitive answer on that. Some groups, such as Resources for the Future, have said, if you want to call it a bridge to the future, it's a pretty shaky bridge to a cleaner energy future. Uh, there's definitely uh, natural gas is a cleaner burning fuel, but if you look at the whole life cycle, and it all depends on how you look at it, if you look at the whole life cycle, the, the real benefits of natural gas sometimes are there. It, it all depends on you know, the entire process and what it's being used for in terms of how much cleaner it, it is, really. I also just want to acknowledge that the Michigan Department of Environmental Quality is right now going through a proposed rule revisions regarding hydraulic factoring on a couple of key issues around uh, decisions uh, that are made regarding approving the water withdrawals, uh, issues around sampling, monitoring, and reporting, and how chemicals that are used in the process, how information is shared about that. Uh, this is all underway. This is uh, separate from the integrated assessment that, that we're doing at U of M. Uh, but we're working, you know, we're trying to keep abreast of this, and we're talking quite a bit with folks at DEQ. We met with them about uh, two weeks ago, actually. Uh, to learn a little bit more about what's going on with this process and how to best align what we're doing and, you know, kind of uh, make sure what we're doing is informed by what the state is moving ahead with right now. With some of these, uh, the state is kind of putting into more uh, kind of formal plans and, and processes for what's been done in practice for the past couple of years. And in other things like the chemical disclosure, it's shifting the way that it's doing it and moving to something called FRAC Focus, which is a national uh, database of uh, states across the country that share information about what has been used in the hydraulic fracturing process. Okay. So a little bit more background information on this topic of you know, what the concerns and, and the, what are people thinking about this. I just wanted to share two slides about a uh, study that was done in about the past year and a half by a group called Resources for the Future. They tried to identify you know, what are the pathways, the risks pathways, when thinking about this whole topic of they would say shale gas development, other people have called hydraulic fracturing, but it's, you know, the hydraulic fracturing is to get the gas from the shale. Um, what, how do people think about this? And so they went out to several hundred individuals across a broad range of sectors, industry, government, uh, in non-governmental organizations, and the research community or academia to ask them, you know, what are your concerns about this topic? What, what, how should we understand, you know, where the risks are and, and how serious some of those might be? So they did this risk pathways analysis and, uh, you know, shared the, the website there. I believe everything will be available later on that folks can, can go back or I'll have my contact information too if anybody wants uh, to get a hold of this information. But what's interesting is that, you know, of the 12 consensus pathways, so this is kind of their diagram of looking at the four different uh, groups that they uh, contacted and, you know, some industry only was concerned about it, other things that non-governmental organizations were only concerned about. And then there were these areas where there was overlap the 12 consensus where each group identified, you know, a particular risk pathway or there was some agreement on those risk pathways. Uh, seven involved concerns about surface water quality, two were about air quality, two were about groundwater quality, and one was related to habitat disruption in terms of these 12 uh, consensus areas. But it's interesting, out of all these things that they looked at, only two were specific to shale gas development, and those were concerns about uh, the fracturing fluids uh, and possibility and the potential for surface water uh, contamination during use or dis storage or disposal of those. So that was the only kind of, and everybody agreed about that. And I think this kind of shows too that there's, you know, it's, are we talking about oil and gas in general or are we talking just about hydraulic fracturing? What was clear from this is it was really hard for the experts 
to kind of separate out, okay, we're talking about hydraulic fracturing or we're talking about oil and gas development in general. So now I want to focus just on this integrated assessment that we're doing. Uh, we're about a little bit over a year into, and we'll probably wrap up sometime later this year. So we developed this topic. Uh, it took us about a year of work to kind of come to this because, you know, there's a lot of discussion on this topic uh, across the country. There are some regions, such as the Northeast, where it's broader than just one state. Uh, you know, we looked at this and said, you know, there's a lot of interest, there's a lot of passion, there's a lot of uh, uh, kind of strong opinions on this topic. And when we look for kind of our next integrated assessment, we try to identify those areas around which there is that kind of high degree of interest, but perhaps not, you know, uh, a real consensus of what the issue is, a real consensus about what the concerns are. And we try to you know, identify those as an opportunity for us to you know, provide some support, provide some meaning, provide, you know, to help advance the discussion. And so through our kind of uh, conversations and kind of outreach that we were doing, we focused in on a Michigan-specific assessment. And the reason we did that is because you know, there's, uh, when you look at hydraulic fracturing across the country, most of the regula regulations are at the state level. So it's, it's kind of hard to do a multi-state analysis when you've got states with varying regulations. Um, there's also, you know, there's issues related to uh, geology of different regions and what that means, both in terms of how the process is done or what the risks might be. So there's a real, some specific issues uh, that kind of guided us and directed us to look specifically at Michigan. And the other reason that we, you know, went with this is, you know, I'd say there's still kind of characterizes the, the current situation is while there's a lot of interest and perhaps some concern about this topic, uh, there's real limited activity. And I think there's an opportunity for some discussion and work and analysis of this topic and an opportunity for, for uh, conversation around this that maybe some other parts of the country are kind of beyond or past because of how contentious it's become or because of some of the you know, real on the ground issues that they've been facing. So we thought there was an opportunity to really look at this from a Michigan specific focus. So we've put together this structure of in the center there, we've got uh, the U of M uh, partners that we're calling an integration team. And then we're working with a report team that represents multiple units and departments across the university to do the analysis for us. Uh, we're definitely working with stakeholders. We've had an ongoing uh, stakeholder engagement process since we started this project about a year and a half ago. To date, we've probably received more than 300 comments from folks across the state, really across the state, the far upper peninsula, all throughout the lower peninsula. Uh, we've heard from folks. We've had a couple of forums and webinars on this event. We're, we plan to do more of those to get people's uh, input on the topic. And we also have an advisory committee of external and U of M members to help you know, uh, give us some uh, perspectives from different uh, groups. And I'll share with you in a minute who's on that advisory committee. And then we see the integrated assessment report team generating a report that will go back through these other groups and produce a final report sometime later this year. We're fortunate to have this advisory committee that, as I mentioned before, has representatives from, from industry, from the state, from environmental groups, and from different units across the university. And I just want to acknowledge Tammy Newcomb in the back from DNR, who's one of the members of the advisory committee. And we meet with the group about every couple of months to kind of talk about where we're at, where we think we're going. It's advisory in terms of, you know, they you know, tell us what they think about a topic or they share information that we think we should uh, have, but it's, you know, we're trying to keep the information kind of uh, independent through the, the U of M report team that, you know, we want to have this information, uh, people talk with us about it, you know, look at it with us, give us their input, but the actual decisions about what's going to be in the report are guided by the U of M partners. So what have we done? So we've kind of completed the first phase which was last year, where we generated these technical reports, uh, trying to, if you remember that diagram I was showing you with those kind of three columns coming, coming down, we needed to pull together information on the topic. And we did this on seven uh, different areas, uh, technology, geology, health, ecology, law, economics, and public perceptions. 
And each one of these was led by one or two faculty members with a group of students to try to pull together, they were aiming for the best information at the time about what's going on in Michigan uh, in terms of history, technology, uh, potential concerns, uh, the whole range of issues. And the point was to have that information as kind of a foundation for future work, uh, to share that with decision makers, uh, and to use for later policy analysis. So we really wanted to, you know, pull this information together. And we do this with all of our integrated assessments. Try to, this is kind of the first stage of let's just try to get some of the best information that we can together on this topic, and pull that in a way, pull that together in a way that can be useful and helpful to folks. Uh, and as you can see, we had representation across a variety of units, uh, School of Natural Resources, Public Health, Law, a whole range of departments and, and folks worked with us, both faculty and students, to produce those reports. Um, we released those uh, back in September and they're all still available on our website. I think we've had over more than uh, 3,000 visits to that website and people downloading these or accessing these reports. So we think, you know, this isn't the, the final product, but this has been an important product and step in the process to put this information together. And I'll just share, you know, just some brief snippets. You know, each of these is kind of a pretty compact report of 40 to maybe 70 pages. So it's hard to do it justice with a sentence or two, but just a little bit on each one of these reports. Uh, so that, you know, some highlights from the technology report is that, you know, it's really hard to say how much more activity we're going to see in the future. Uh, and the concern that was expressed or that what was identified by the faculty authors from this is, you know, with the low gas price, you know, uh, is that going to limit further development in Michigan? Maybe, it's, it's hard to say. Um, and the geology, you know, it, it provides a real good uh, overview of uh, the information that you'd want to know about the state's geology and hydrogeology related to high volume hydraulic fracturing. And really kind of identified that there's really only a handful of wells that have actually been completed at the, uh, above that high volume threshold. And the environment and ecology, you know, identified the a list of kind of potential hazards. Uh, I want to be clear in talking about the material that's in these reports is best characterized as a hazard identification. Uh, we did not do a formal risk assessment with many of these topics. That would take years, depending on the issue that you might be looking at, and millions of dollars. But we tried to do a comprehensive and systematic uh, hazard identification. So that's what can be found in the environment ecology report and in the public health report. Kind of looking very comprehensively from, you know, what is the impact on the site itself in terms of uh, potential disruption to what are broader concerns that have been uh, raised about this topic in terms of uh, some broader community impacts as we're seeing more activity in some areas. Uh, for some communities, it's uh, viewed as a benefit, right? This is economic development. This is what we want to do to improve our community. For others, it's seen as, you know, there's less certainty about that in terms of are there are more risks associated with this than benefits. Policy and law kind of gives a, a real kind of comprehensive overview of what is the current status of primarily state uh, regulations, laws, and policies on this topic, and also some relevant uh, federal. Um, the interesting thing here, just to kind of know, show how, you know, this is a dynamic issue. Uh, one of the things that uh, Sarah Gossman, the law school faculty member who led this report, you know, talked about the process for that DEQ uses for disclosing the information. The state was doing it. I want to go back to what I mentioned before in terms of this process that DEQ is, is kind of starting with this draft process. They're thinking about changing that process. So already some of the things in the reports that we released back last September, we're already looking at things have changed already or are the, they're potentially changing. It's a draft rule change. Um, economics kind of looked at some of the, couldn't look specifically at high volume hydraulic fracturing because there hasn't really been that much to know exactly what are the economic uh, pros or cons from that, but kind of look more broadly at oil and gas 
and said, you know, there's some benefits that are experienced through this, but, um, you know, it's not going to be a deal breaker for the state in terms of its economy. At uh, one point, if you want to roll back the clock, not in Michigan, but some other states, uh, you know, the leaders in those states were saying we're going to base our economic future of this state on hi expanded hydraulic fracturing. It's really hard to talk about it in that kind of expansive terms for Michigan, uh, particularly with high volume hydraulic fracturing, given the limited amount of activity we've seen to date. But there's, you know, pr different projections of what's potentially there. It's, there's, there's a lot of interest, but we haven't seen that much activity yet. And then the public perceptions one was, uh, you know, I think as the, our advisory group kind of looked at this, I think this one kind of caught some of the uh, most significant attention. I think peaks people valued the stuff that was in the other ones, but kind of looking at how the public looks at this topic and how it depends on if you're in a community that has had oil and gas development or maybe not in Michigan, some other communities outside of the state that have had this high volume activity. You know, how do people look at it? What are their concerns? Are they more supportive of the topic if they're kind of living with it on a day-to-day -day basis and see it, or is it more you know, the concerns are from folks that see it as an unknown. So this provides a really thorough examination of public perceptions. And I can't do it justice in the minute or two here, but I'd say it's, it's really, all of them are worth a read, but I think in terms of understanding public attitudes and opinions, uh, this is really one to turn to. They kind of look comprehensively at dozens of surveys and, and uh, reports that were done looking at public perception of the topic. and it's. And, and it, I think it raises one of these questions is, is just more information helpful? Not always. It, you know, on complex issues, sometimes just trying to push out more information on a complex issue without trying to, you know, uh, assist the user with that information isn't the most effective. So that was phase one. That's been completed. As I said, those reports are available on our website. Um, uh, we've heard from folks around the state that they've, you know, they're useful tools for understanding the Michigan specific issues related to this topic. They're useful for local communities that are trying to get a handle on this topic as they see perhaps uh, more activity potentially in their community to try to understand the topic. Well, so we've, we've done that, and those are all available. And now we're moving into phase two, which we've gone from these seven separate technical reports, and while you know, the teams met and talked to each other, they were really seven separate reports. Now we're shifting to what we're really calling the integrated assessment. It's an entire process, but now we're coming up with an integrated assessment report where we'll take some of the key issues that were identified in the technical reports, plus what we've heard through the extensive kind of public comments that we've received on this topic, to identify a set of key policy topics and areas which we'll do an analysis on. And I'll share some of those topics in a minute, but that's kind of where we're at now. We're trying to come forward with this analysis of key policy topics for the state of Michigan on the topic with a focus on high volume activity. But as we've said before, it's kind of hard to separate it out and say we're only talking about high volume activity here when the, the impact or the benefit or the concern might be broader than just high volume activity. Uh, we've got uh, a new team formed for this report team. Several of the folks that were involved in preparing the technical reports are continuing with us. But because we're working with a slightly different set of topics and issues, we reached out across the university to kind of expand our uh, list of experts that we're working with. So these folks are meeting another week uh, to kind of go through and identify the topics and do the analysis of topics and we'll come up with a draft report that we'll have available uh, later this year for input. But you can see we're still working with a very broad range of issues from economics to health policy to uh, risk communication. You know, how do we talk about the issue uh, that people are concerned about? So here's, a, I'll call this draft, and a list of working policy topics that the team is currently working with. And they're kind of, uh, you know, we can look at them in terms of, you know, before activity begins, during activity, meaning the drilling and fracturing, and kind of after activity. And then there's some things that are more cross-cutting that, you know, might be issues to think about at any stage in the process. So what the, teams are, what the team is doing now is, uh, we're actually meeting again on Thursday, as I said, we meet every other week. We're working through these to identify specific uh, policy options 
And then what we hope to offer, what we're moving towards is that, you know, we're not going to come up with a recommendation and say this is what must be done on the topic. We're going to look at some of these key issues, uh, such as disclosure. That's a issue that's of importance, I think, to folks in Michigan and across the country in terms of sharing the information about what's used in the process, uh, the chemicals or the other additives that are used. Uh, you know, what is the, the so what, we'll, what we're aiming for with the report is that something like chemical disclosure will share what's the current status quo, what's currently being done. And that's one's already, as I mentioned before, that's one that's kind of in transition perhaps. Uh, DEQ is suggesting to move to a different system. But we'll talk about either what's being done or what's being proposed and then share information about, well, what's a, maybe a different way to do that and another alternative. So maybe to try to provide the status quo and two other alternative policy options and, what, and analyze those. What are the benefits of this, these alternative approaches? What are some of the, the challenges or the, you know, the, the, the significant cost factor? Well, it could be a whole range of things with, if going with that other policy option. But the goal is to offer that analysis of options, not to say this is what must be done uh, regarding chemical disclosure, but to say, here's what's being done and here are some other alternatives and to analyze those options. And you know, once we kind of get through that, we're also hoping to think about the uncertainty that goes along with it. You know, right now we're seeing very limited activity in the state and that might suggest a, curtain, a certain set of a uh, bundle of policies around the topic. But if we find ourselves 10 years, five years down the road in a very different context where perhaps there's a lot more activity or perhaps no activity at all, that might suggest a different set of, a uh, different suite of policy options. So we're trying to address, you know, some uncertainty that goes along with this topic and think about different futures where we might see, in one example, different levels of activity and how to kind of give uh, helpful information to think about those different futures. So just kind of uh, wrapping up before we move into questions, we've you know, talked about where we've come, where we're at right now as we're in the midst of drafting this integrated assessment report. We hope to share that with the advisory committee uh, later this, uh, sometime in the spring. We also plan to sh put that out for public comment. We're also going to do a, a technical expert kind of uh, panel review of that too. Uh, so we've got the input from the advisory committee, we've got input from anybody who really wants to share their ideas about it, and then we're going to pull together a group of panel, uh, panel of experts that have not been involved in this process but are knowledgeable about the topic, both within Michigan and outside of Michigan, to give us some feedback on that report, on those analysis of options. So we're trying to run this through uh, all the different ways that we can seek input and refine it and improve it. Um, and then, you know, we don't have a specific timeline, but we're hoping to have the finalized report ready and available in the fall. So with that, I'll kind of wrap it up. And Veronica, we can just, we have time for questions? And just open it up, just go free with it. Okay, I think you were the first. Yes, sir. Water, hundreds of thousands of and does the water just come from the aquifer and then it's done by hand after it's injected back in the level? And a whole series of uh, important questions. So let me repeat them, uh, make sure I the right thing. So uh, the volumes of water over what time period, right? Uh, and then where does, where does it come from and where does it go? Does that summarize it? Okay. So uh, the, the volume of water over what time period? It, Right? It depends on uh, folks that are doing the completion, that's called, in terms of you know, what they're experiencing as they're doing the drilling. I can't give you, you know, they're, they're different, there's a rank. It depends on what they kind of. But it's over the course of the well, the drilling operation, is that the time? During the, during the fracturing, not, not the drilling itself. But so you drill the well, and now you're going back in and you're going to fracture the shale grass that you've exposed to drip. And it's in that peak time is when the fluid is used. Okay. Uh, where does it come from? Uh, this is part of the, the state approval process, but it, 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 it can come from a uh, local well on the site that, that's drilled. It, I think it can also come from uh, a nearby municipality that might supply the water. Um, it, it can 
Right. But I think that's a part of the, the review and the permitting process too. A deep well inject and dispose of the what's called the flow back water, which comes back up into deep wells, which is a common approach used for disposing other fluids like that. That's what's done in Michigan. There are different approaches in other states, but in Michigan there's the capacity to do that. In other states, like Pennsylvania does not have the capacity to deep well inject those fluids, so they're looking, they sometimes they ship it to Ohio. Uh, other times there, there are approaches to recycle and reuse that. Uh, so there's a range of approaches, but in Michigan, uh, deep well injection is the approach uh, for disposing of the fluids. So you hear yeah, sir. Um, not off the subject, I don't think, but sustainability, your mm -hmm. institute, the mm -hmm. name of your institute, that term mm -hmm. is used very loosely by a lot of policymakers. Mm -hmm. How do you define that for purposes of and, and relating it to what you're doing in this integrated approach. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'd say you're right. Sustainability can mean a broad range of things. It can mean different things to different folks. Uh, we at the Institute don't have a specific definition that we're kind of like locked in, like it means this. Uh, in general, we take an approach that there should be a consideration of you know, economic issues, environmental issues, social issues. The emphasis on those can shift depending on the projects. Uh, and we see that in the ones that we've been working on. There's more of an environmental focus in one. There's more of an equity or social dimension in another. So we say it's, you know, our approach is that it's defined by the issues that we're working on and what we're trying to accomplish. So we don't have one specific, you know, uh, all purpose definition of sustainability for this, but we, generally try, well, we do, we, one requirement though is that it have considerations of, of social dimension, an environmental dimension, and an economic dimension. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, I, a lot of the concern revolves around fresh water being used. Like you said, it gets disposed, so it's looked at as a loss of fresh water. I'm just wondering if you or some of your groups that are looking at the, the notion that when the natural gas is burned, a, a byproduct of burning natural gas is fresh water. And, and actually, I, I believe it's in the neighborhood of two to four years, depending on the volume of gas that's produced from a well, you're actually producing more fresh water that goes back in the system through burning it than was disposed of you know, through the fracking process. And I, I just wondered if you've looked at that notion. I think that was, I, I'd have to double check to be certain, but I believe it was uh, discussed in the technology report, uh, one of the technical reports. I'd say, you know, this is not my particular area of expertise. I've, I've read the articles. I've seen the, the equations that, that support this. I'd say the, the questions that come up about it, though, is where the water is used and then where is burned are, are separate. So if you're concerned about uh, water within a particular system, right. they might be, di there's, most likely they're going to be disconnected. Right. Yeah. Yes, sir. Why is the fracking more of a hot water issue here in Michigan compared to other states? Well, it'd be interesting to post that <laughs> to, the, to the group. I'd say my assessment of that, my idea is we haven't seen the volume the high volume activity, we haven't seen. Why not? Why not? Uh, it's, I don't think there's any one answer. I think the low price of natural gas right now is a factor. Uh, I don't know all the details, but there might be additional costs associated with activity in Michigan regarding you know, accessing the resource that might not be as expensive in other regions. I mean, that's a, that's a very gross, simplified thing, but I'd, you know, there's probably some factors that are inhibiting more activity. I'd say economics is one of them. I don't have that right at my fingertips. So Michigan is definitely a player, but it's not one of the, the most uh, significant players in terms of the resource. It's significant, but there's other parts of the country like Marcellus, Bakken in Texas, parts of Wyoming that I think the resource, uh, defining the resource and measuring the resource would be seen as greater. Yes, sir. <coughs> One of the reports is on the law aspect. Yes. What what 
idea, if anything, you can say that it came up with in terms of Michigan's legal structure now for dealing with this, um, both statutory and, <coughs> and administrative rules. So do we have did it identify that we're in good shape? Um, I don't. Th the the technical report didn't kind of take that approach to kind of give that assessment. It was more descriptive, in terms of. Um, but I'd say you know, again, my opinion, kind of very rough estimation of this. Michigan's doing things better than some other places, in terms of the approach, in terms of the reviews, in terms of. Uh, managing the issue, but I think there's still lots of questions that folks have, particularly as we, sh this shift in scale uh, from the activity we've seen over the past couple of decades to the more high volume activity in terms of the volume of water that's used and the volume of additives that's used, that's the question. And, and whether, you know, particularly something like, uh, let me focus in on one thing. So right now there's the, it's called the water withdrawal assessment tool that if you want to use more than that 100,000 gallons, you have to, it's an online tool that the DEQ has to help in the permitting process to determine the amount of water that's going to be used and what the impacts are going to be on that. So that's, that's you know, it's, it's, it's a benefit that we have that type of system to guide our decision making. There's still some questions though, is that the right type of decision making tool to use for short term intense withdrawals? As I understand it, I believe the tool was more developed for kind of longer term kind of withdrawals over, over time. But very intense, high volume, is that the best approach? I don't have the answer for that yet. We've got some folks uh, on the team, uh, the person who's looking at that has spent quite a bit of time analyzing the tool for its variety of uses. And those will be some of the policy options that we come up with. You know, this is what's currently done, pros and cons of that. Here's another approach might offer some other ideas of how to, how to get at this issue of determining what are the impacts of, you know, the water withdrawal and the water use. Yes, anything else? No, Veronica? Please join me once again in thanking our speaker today. Thank you. Association and Office of the Vice President for Government Relations. I wanted to give you this beautiful gold Wolverine Caucus pin. Awesome. Thank you. Appreciation for your presentation. Well, thank today. you so much. Appreciate that. No, that's wonderful. Thank you. And I want to thank also Representative Martin Powerlack and Representative Gretchen Driscoll for joining us today. And also, as I mentioned, um, the Office of the Vice President for Government Relations is, is always excited that you come and join us and wanted to acknowledge Rebecca DeBoot, who's here, uh, State Relations Director, and Angela McCullough, who helps us to put these together. And of course, you know me, Veronica Wilkinson Johnson. We hope that you'll join us again in February, on February 26th, Wednesday, February 26th, when we will have a UNM regent here, that's Regent Mark Bernstein, talking about college affordability and access, something we're all interested in. So again, thank you for being here today. We will have uh, the presentations from Dr. Callenport available if any of you are interested in what he presented today or if you have further questions going forward. So have a good afternoon and please stay warm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>